Boxing Boxing is a combat sport in which two people engage in a contest of strength, speed, reflexes, endurance, and will by throwing punches with gloved hands against each other. Amateur boxing is an Olympic and Commonwealth sport and is a common fixture in most of the major international games, it also has its own world championships. Boxing is supervised by a referee over a series of one to three minute intervals called rounds. The result is decided when an opponent is deemed incapable to continue by a referee, is disqualified for breaking a rule, resigns by throwing in a towel, or is pronounced the winner or loser based on the judges' scorecards at the end of the contest. The origin of boxing may be its acceptance by the ancient Greeks as an Olympic game in BCE 688. Boxing evolved from 16th and 18th century prize fights, largely in Great Britain, to the forerunner of modern boxing in the mid 19th century, again initially in Great Britain and later in the United States. History Early history See also Ancient Greek boxing. First depicted in ancient Egyptian relief from the 2nd millennium BC depicts both fist fighters and spectators. Both depictions show bare-fisted contests. Other depictions in the 2nd millennium BC can be seen in reliefs from the Mesopotamian nations of Assyria and Babylonia, and in Hittite art from Asia Minor. The earliest evidence for fist fighting with any kind of gloves can be found on Minoan Crete, c. 1500-900 BC, and on Sardinia, if we consider the boxing statues of Priamo Mountains, c. 2000-1000 BC. Early Boxing Boxing was originally nothing more than bare fist fighting between two willing and sometimes unwilling competitors. As a sport, fighting has been around for thousands of years where it first arose in parts of Africa, including ancient Egypt before spreading to parts of southern Europe. The ancient Greeks believed that fighting was a game played by the gods on Olympus. The Romans had a keen interest in the sport and fighting soon became a common spectator sport. In order for the fighters to protect themselves against their opponents they wrapped leather thongs around their fists. Eventually harder leather was used and the thong soon became a weapon. The Romans even introduced metal studs to the thongs to make the cestus which then led to a more sinister weapon called the mimex, limpiesa. Fighting events were held at Roman amphitheaters. The Roman form of boxing was often a fight until death to please the spectators who gathered at such events. However, especially in later times, purchased slaves and trained combat performers were valuable commodities, and their lives were not given up without due consideration. Often slaves were used against one another in a circle marked on the floor. This is where the term ring came from. In 393 AD, during the Roman gladiator period, Boxing was abolished due to excessive brutality. It was not until the late 17th century that boxing resurfaced in London. Modern Boxing Broadens Rules 1743 Records of classical boxing activity disappeared after the fall of the Western Roman Empire when the wearing of weapons became common once again and interest in fighting with the fists waned. However, there are detailed records of various fist fighting sports that were maintained in different cities and provinces of Italy between the 12th and 17th centuries. There was also a sport in ancient Rus called Kulichnye boy or fist fighting. As the wearing of swords became less common, there was renewed interest in fencing with the fists. The sport would later resurface in England during the early 16th century in the form of bare knuckle boxing sometimes referred to as prize fighting. The first documented account of a bare-knuckle fight in England appeared in 1681 in the London Protestant Mercury, and the first English bare-knuckle champion was James Fig in 1719. This is also the time when the word boxing first came to be used. It should be noted, that this earliest form of modern boxing was very different. Contests in Mr. Fig's time, in addition to fist fighting, also contained fencing and cudgeling. On January 6, 1681, the first recorded boxing match took place in Britain when Christopher Monk, 2nd Duke of Albemarle, and later Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica, engineered a bout between his butler and his butcher with the latter winning the prize. Early fighting had no written rules. 
there were no weight divisions or round limits, and no referee. In general, it was extremely chaotic. The first boxing rules, called the Broughton's Rules, were introduced by champion Jack Broughton in 1743 to protect fighters in the ring where death sometimes occurred. Under these rules, if a man went down and could not continue after a count of 30 seconds, the fight was over. Hitting a downed fighter and grasping below the waist were prohibited. Broughton also invented and encouraged the use of mufflers, a form of padded gloves, which were used in training and exhibitions. The first paper on boxing was published in the early 1700s by a successful Cornish wrestler from Bunyip, Cornwall, named Sir Thomas Parkins, who was also a physics student of Sir Isaac Newton. The paper was actually a single page in his extensive wrestling and fencing manual that entailed a system of head butting, punching, eye gouging, chokes, and hard throws not common in modern boxing. Parkins added the techniques described in his paper to his own fighting style. These rules did allow the fighters an advantage not enjoyed by today's boxers. They permitted the fighter to drop to one knee to begin a 30-second count at any time. Thus a fighter realizing he was in trouble had an opportunity to recover. However, this was considered unmanly, and was frequently disallowed by additional rules negotiated by the seconds of their boxers. Intentionally going down in modern boxing will cause the recovering fighter to lose points in the scoring system. Furthermore, as the contestants did not have heavy leather gloves and wrist straps to protect their hands, they used different punching technique to preserve their hands because the head was a common target to hit full out as almost all period manuals have powerful straight punches with the whole body behind them to the face, including forehead, as the basic blows. London Prize Ring Rules 1838 In 1838, the London Prize Ring Rules were codified. Later revised in 1853, they stipulated the following. Fights occurred in a 24 feet, 7.3 m, square ring surrounded by ropes. If a fighter were knocked down, he had to rise within 30 seconds under his own power to be allowed to continue. Biting, head butting and hitting below the belt were declared illegal. Marquess of Queensbury Rules 1867 In 1867, the Marquess of Queensbury rules were drafted by John Chambers for amateur championships held at Lilly Bridge in London for lightweights, middleweights and heavyweights. The rules were published under the patronage of the Marquess of Queensbury, whose name has always been associated with them. There were 12 rules in all, and they specified that fights should be a fair stand-up boxing match in a 24-foot square or similar ring. Rounds were three minutes with one-minute rest intervals between rounds. Each fighter was given a 10-second count if he were knocked down, and wrestling was banned. The introduction of gloves of fair size also changed the nature of the bouts. An average pair of boxing gloves resembles a bloated pair of mittens and are laced up around the wrists. The gloves can be used to block an opponent's blows. As a result of their introduction, bouts became longer and more strategic with greater importance attached to defensive maneuvers such as slipping, bobbing, countering and angling. Because less defensive emphasis was placed on the use of the forearms and more on the gloves, the classical forearms outwards, torso-leaning back stance of the bare-knuckle boxer was modified to a more modern stance in which the torso is tilted forward and the hands are held closer to the face. Modern Through the late 19th century, the martial art of boxing or prize fighting was primarily a sport of dubious legitimacy. Outlawed in England and much of the United States, prize fights were often held at gambling venues and broken up by police. Brawling and wrestling tactics continued, and riots at prize fights were common occurrences. Still, throughout this period, there arose some notable bare knuckle champions who developed fairly sophisticated fighting tactics. The English case of a V. Coney in 1882 found that a bare knuckle fight was an assault occasioning actual bodily harm, despite the consent of the participants. This marked the end of widespread public bare knuckle contests in England. The first world heavyweight champion under the Queensbury rules was gentleman Jim Corbett, who defeated John L. Sullivan in 1892 at the Pelican Athletic Club in New Orleans. Throughout the early 20th century, 
Fox has struggled to achieve legitimacy, aided by the influence of promoters like Tex Rickard and the popularity of great champions from John L. Sullivan to David Olivers. Rules The Marquis of Queensbury rules have been the general rules governing modern boxing since their publication in 1867. A boxing match typically consists of a determined number of three-minute rounds, a total of up to 12 rounds, formerly 15. A minute is typically spent between each round with the fighters in their assigned corners receiving advice and attention from their coach and staff. The fight is controlled by a referee who works within the ring to judge and control the conduct of the fighters, rule on their ability to fight safely, count knockdown fighters, and rule on fouls. Up to three judges are typically present at ringside to score the bout and assign points to the boxers, based on punches that connect, defense, knockdowns, and other, more subjective, measures. Because of the open-ended style of boxing judging, many fights have controversial results, in which one or both fighters believe they have been robbed, or unfairly denied a victory. Each fighter has an assigned corner of the ring, where his or her coach, as well as one or more seconds may administer to the fighter at the beginning of the fight and between rounds. Each boxer enters into the ring from their assigned corners at the beginning of each round and must cease fighting and return to their corner at the signaled end of each round. A bout in which the predetermined number of rounds passes is decided by the judges, and is said to go the distance. The fighter with the higher score at the end of the fight is ruled the winner. With three judges, unanimous and split decisions are possible, as are draws. A boxer may win the bout before a decision is reached through a knockout. Such bouts are said to have ended inside the distance. If a fighter is knocked down during the fight, determined by whether the boxer touches the canvas floor of the ring with any part of their body other than the feet as a result of the opponent's punch and not a slip, as determined by the referee, the referee begins counting until the fighter returns to his or her feet and can continue. Should the referee count to ten, then the knockdown boxer is ruled knocked out, whether unconscious or not, and the other boxer is ruled the winner by knockout, KO. A technical knockout, TKO, is possible as well, and is ruled by the referee, fight doctor, or a fighter's corner if a fighter is unable to safely continue to fight, based upon injuries or being judged unable to effectively defend themselves. Many jurisdictions and sanctioning agencies also have a three-knockdown rule, in which three knockdowns in a given round result in a TKO. A TKO is considered a knockout in a fighter's record. A standing eight-count rule may also be in effect. This gives the referee the right to step in and administer a count of eight to a fighter that he feels may be in danger, even if no knockdown has taken place. After counting the referee will observe the fighter, and decide if he is fit to continue. For scoring purposes, a standing eight count is treated as a knockdown. In general, Boxers are prohibited from hitting below the belt, holding, tripping, pushing, biting, or spitting. The boxer's shorts are raised so the opponent is not allowed to hit to the groin area with intent to cause pain or injury. Failure to abide by the former may result in a foul. They also are prohibited from kicking, head butting, or hitting with any part of the arm other than the knuckles of a closed fist, including hitting with the elbow, shoulder or forearm as well as with open gloves, the wrist, the inside, back or side of the hand. They are prohibited as well from hitting the back, back of the neck or head, called a rabbit punch or the kidneys. They are prohibited from holding the ropes for support when punching, holding an opponent while punching, or ducking below the belt of their opponent, dropping below the waist of your opponent, no matter the distance between. If a clinch a defensive move in which a boxer wraps his or her opponent's arms and holds on to create a pause, is broken by the referee, each fighter must take a full step back before punching again, alternatively, the referee may direct the fighters to punch out of the clinch. When a boxer is knocked down, the other boxer must immediately cease fighting and move to the furthest neutral corner of the ring until the referee has either ruled a knockout or called for the fight to continue. Violations of these rules may be ruled fouls by the referee, who may issue warnings, deduct points, or disqualify an offending boxer, causing an automatic loss, depending on the seriousness and intentionality of the foul. 
an intentional foul that causes injury that prevents a fight from continuing usually causes the boxer who committed it to be disqualified. A fighter who suffers an accidental low blow may be given up to five minutes to recover, after which they may be ruled knocked out if they are unable to continue. Accidental fouls that cause injury ending about may lead to a no contest result, or else cause the fight to go to a decision if enough rounds, typically four or more, or at least three in a four round fight, have passed. Unheard of these days, but common during the early 20th century in North America, a newspaper decision, NWS, might be made after a no decision bout had ended. A no decision bout occurred when, by law or by prearrangement of the fighters, if both boxes were still standing at the fight's conclusion and there was no knockout, no official decision was rendered and neither boxer was declared the winner. But this did not prevent the pool of ringside newspaper reporters from declaring a consensus result among themselves and printing a newspaper decision in their publications. Officially, however, a no decision bout resulted in neither boxer winning or losing. Boxing historians sometimes use these unofficial newspaper decisions in compiling fight records for illustrative purposes only. Often, media outlets covering a match will personally score the match, and post their scores as an independent sentence in their report. Professional versus Amateur Boxing Throughout the 17th through 19th centuries, boxing bouts were motivated by money, as the fighters competed for prize money, promoters controlled the gate, and spectators bet on the result. The modern Olympic movement revived interest in amateur sports, and amateur boxing became an Olympic sport in 1908. In their current form, Olympic and other amateur bouts are typically limited to three or four rounds, scoring is computed by points based on the number of clean blows landed, regardless of impact, and fighters wear protective headgear, reducing the number of injuries, knockdowns, and knockouts. Currently scoring blows in amateur boxing are subjectively counted by ringside judges, but the Australian Institute for Sport has demonstrated a prototype of an automated boxing scoring system, which introduces scoring objectivity, improves safety, and arguably makes the sport more interesting to spectators. Professional boxing remains by far the most popular form of the sport globally, though amateur boxing is dominant in Cuba and some former Soviet republics. For most fighters, an amateur career, especially at the Olympics, serves to develop skills and gain experience in preparation for a professional career. Amateur boxing Amateur boxing may be found at the collegiate level, at the Olympic Games and Commonwealth Games, and in many other venues sanctioned by amateur boxing associations. Amateur boxing has a point scoring system that measures the number of clean blows landed rather than physical damage. Bouts consist of three rounds of three minutes in the Olympic and Commonwealth Games, and three rounds of three minutes in a National ABA, Amateur Boxing Association, bout, each with a one minute interval between rounds. Competitors wear protective headgear and gloves with a white strip or circle across the knuckle. A punch is considered a scoring punch only when the boxers connect with the white portion of the gloves. Each punch that lands cleanly on the head or torso with sufficient force is awarded a point. A referee monitors the fight to ensure that competitors use only legal blows. A belt worn over the torso represents the lower limit of punches, any boxer repeatedly landing low blows below the belt is disqualified. Referees also ensure that the boxers don't use holding tactics to prevent the opponent from swinging. If this occurs, the referee separates the opponents and orders them to continue boxing. Repeated holding can result in a boxer being penalized or ultimately disqualified. Referees will stop the bout if a boxer is seriously injured, if one boxer is significantly dominating the other or if the score is severely imbalanced. Amateur bouts which end this way may be noted as RSC. Referee stopped contest, with notations for an outclassed opponent, RSCO, outscored opponent, RSCOS, injury, RSCI, or head injury, RSCH. Professional boxing Professional bouts are usually much longer than amateur bouts, typically ranging from 10 to 12 rounds, though four-round fights are common for less experienced fighters or club fighters. There are also some two- and three-round professional bouts, 
especially in Australia. Through the early 20th century, it was common for fights to have unlimited rounds, ending only when one fighter quit, benefiting high-energy fighters like Jack Dempsey. Fifteen rounds remained the internationally recognized limit for championship fights for most of the 20th century until the early 1980s, when the death of boxer Duke Kakim eventually prompted the World Boxing Council and other organizations sanctioning professional boxing to reduce the limit to 12 rounds. Headgear is not permitted in professional bouts, and boxers are generally allowed to take much more damage before a fight is halted. At any time, however, the referee may stop the contest if he believes that one participant cannot defend himself due to injury. In that case, the other participant is awarded a technical knockout win. A technical knockout would also be awarded if a fighter lands a punch that opens a cut on the opponent, and the opponent is later deemed not fit to continue by a doctor because of the cut. For this reason, fighters often employ cutmen, whose job is to treat cuts between rounds so that the boxer is able to continue despite the cut. If a boxer simply quits fighting, or if his corner stops the fight, then the winning boxer is also awarded a technical knockout victory. In contrast with amateur boxing, professional male boxers have to be bare-chested. Boxing Styles Definition of Style Style is often defined as the strategic approach a fighter takes during a bout. No two fighters' styles are alike, as it is determined by that individual's physical and mental attributes. There are three main styles in boxing, outfighter, boxer, brawler, or slugger, and in fighter, swarmer. These styles may be divided into several special subgroups, such as counterpuncher, etc. The main philosophy of the styles is, that each style has an advantage over one, but disadvantage over the other one. It follows the rock-paper-scissors scenario, boxer beats brawler, swarmer beats boxer, and brawler beats swarmer. Box around fighter. A classic boxer, or stylist, also known as an outfighter seeks to maintain distance between himself and his opponent, fighting with faster, longer range punches, most notably the jab, and gradually wearing his opponent down. Due to this reliance on weaker punches, outfighters tend to win by point decisions rather than by knockout, though some outfighters have notable knockout records. They are often regarded as the best boxing strategists due to their ability to control the pace of the fight and lead their opponent, methodically wearing him down and exhibiting more skill and finesse than a brawler. Outfighters need reach, hand speed, reflexes, and footwork. Notable outfighters include Muhammad Ali, Larry Holmes, Joe Calzafi, Floyd Mayweather Jr., Wilfredo Gomez, Salvador Sanchez, Cecilia Brighus, Jean Tunney, Ezard Charles, Willie Pep, Mudrick Taylor, Ricardo Lopez, Roy Jones, J.R., and Sugar Ray Leonard. This style was also used by fictional boxer Apollo Creed. Boxer Puncher A boxer puncher is a well-rounded boxer who is able to fight at close range with a combination of technique and power, often with the ability to knock opponents out with a combination and in some instances a single shot. Their movement and tactics are similar to that of an outfighter, although they are generally not as mobile as an outfighter, but instead of winning by decision, they tend to wear their opponents down using combinations and then move in to score the knockout. A boxer must be well-rounded to be effective using this style. Notable boxer punches include Manny Pacquiao, Vladimir Klitschko, Lennox Lewis, Joe Louis, Wilfredo Gomez, Oscar de la Hoya, Archie Moore. Miguel Cotto, Nonito Donaire, Sam Langford, Henry Armstrong, Sugar Ray Robinson, Tony Zale, Carlos Monzon, Alexis Arguello, Eric Morales, Terry Norris, Marco Antonio Barrera, Nassim Hamd, Thomas Hintz and Victor Ortiz. Counterpuncher Counterpunchers are slippery, defensive-style fighters who often rely on their opponents' mistakes in order to gain the advantage whether it be on the scorecards or more preferably a knockout. They use their well-rounded defense to avoid all block shots and then immediately catch the opponent off guard with a well-placed and timed punch. A fight with a skilled counter-puncher can turn into a war of attrition, 
where each shot landed is a battle in itself. Thus, fighting against counter punches requires constant feinting and the ability to avoid telegraphing one's attacks. To be truly successful using this style, they must have good reflexes, a high level of prediction and awareness, pinpoint accuracy and speed, both in striking and in footwork. Notable counter punches include Vitaly Klitschko, Floyd Mayweather, J.R. Evander Holyfield, Max Schmeling, Chris Bird, Jim Corbett, Jack Johnson, Bernard Hopkins, Laszlo Papp, Jerry Quarry, Anselmo Marino, James Tony, Marvin Hagler, Juan Manuel Marquez, Humberto Soto, Roger Mayweather, Pinel Whitaker, and Sergio Gabriel Martinez. Counter punches usually wear their opponents down by causing them to miss their punches. The more the opponent misses, the faster they'll tire and the psychological effects of being unable to land a hit will start to sink in. The counter-puncher often tries to outplay their opponent entirely, not just in a physical sense, but also in a mental and emotional sense. This style can be incredibly difficult, especially against seasoned fighters, but winning a fight without getting hit is often worth the payoff. They usually try to stay away from the center of the ring, in order to outmaneuver and chip away at their opponents. A large advantage in counter-hitting is the forward momentum of the attacker, which drives them further into your return strike. As such, knockouts are more common than one would expect from a defensive style. Brawler Slugger A brawler is a fighter who generally lacks finesse and footwork in the ring, but makes up for it through sheer punching power. Mainly Irish, Irish-American, Puerto Rican, Mexican and Mexican-American boxers popularized this style. Many brawlers tend to lack mobility, preferring a less mobile, more stable platform and have difficulty pursuing fighters who are fast on their feet. They may also have a tendency to ignore combination punching in favor of continuous beatdowns with one hand and by throwing slower, more powerful single punches, such as hooks and uppercuts. Their slowness and predictable punching pattern, Single punches with obvious leads, often leaves them open to counter punches, so successful brawlers must be able to absorb substantial amounts of punishment. However not all brawler slugger fighters are not mobile, some can move around and switch styles if needed but still have the brawler slugger style such as Wilfredo Gomez, Prince Nassim Hamd and Danny Garcia. A brawler's most important assets are power and chin the ability to absorb punishment while remaining able to continue boxing. Examples of this style include George Foreman, Danny Garcia, Wilfredo Gomez, Sonny Liston, John L. Sullivan, Max Baer, Prince Nassim Hamd, Ray Mancini, David Tuey, Arturo Gatti, Mickey Ward, Michael Katsiadis, James Kirkland, Marcos Maidana, Jake LaMotta, Manny Pacquiao, and Ireland's John Duddy. This style of boxing was also used by fictional boxers Rocky Balboa and James Clubber Lang. Brawlers tend to be more predictable and easy to hit but usually fare well enough against other fighting styles because they train to take punches very well. They often have a higher chance than other fighting styles to score a knockout against their opponents because they focus on landing big, powerful hits, instead of smaller, faster attacks. Oftentimes they place focus on training on their upper body instead of their entire body, to increase power and endurance. They also aim to intimidate their opponents because of their power, stature and ability to take a punch. Swarmer in Fighter In fighters swarmers, sometimes called pressure fighters attempt to stay close to an opponent, throwing intense flurries and combinations of hooks and uppercuts. A successful in fighter often needs a good chin, because swarming usually involves being hit with many jabs before they can maneuver inside where they are more effective. In fighters operate best at close range because they are generally shorter and have less reach than their opponents and thus are more effective at a short distance where the longer arms of their opponents make punching awkward. However, several fighters tall for their division have been relatively adept at infighting as well as outfighting. The essence of a swarmer is non-stop aggression. Many short infighters utilize their stature to their advantage, employing a bob and weave defense by bending at the waist to slip underneath or to the sides of incoming punches. Unlike blocking, causing an opponent to miss a punch disrupts his balance, 
permits forward movement past the opponent's extended arm and keeps the hands free to counter. A distinct advantage that infighters have is when throwing uppercuts where they can channel their entire body weight behind the punch. Mike Tyson was famous for throwing devastating uppercuts. Marvin Hagler was known for his hard shin, punching power, body attack and the stalking of his opponents. Some infighters, like Mike Tyson, have been known for being notoriously hard to hit. The key to a swarmer is aggression, endurance, chin, and bobbing and weaving. Notable infighters include Julio Cesar Chavez, Miguel Cotto, Joe Frazier, Danny Garcia, Mike Tyson, Manny Pacquiao, Sol Alvarez, Rocky Marciano, Jack Dempsey, Wayne McCulloch, Harry Greb, David Tue and Ricky Hatton. Combinations of Styles All fighters have primary skills with which they feel most comfortable, but truly elite fighters are often able to incorporate auxiliary styles when presented with a particular challenge. For example, an outfighter will sometimes plant his feet and counterpunch, or a slugger may have the stamina to pressure fight with his power punches. Style Matchups There is a generally accepted rule of thumb about the success each of these boxing styles has against the others. In general, an in-fighter has an advantage over an out-fighter, an out-fighter has an advantage over a brawler, and a brawler has an advantage over an in-fighter. These form a cycle with each style being stronger relative to one, and weaker relative to another, with none dominating, as in rock-paper-scissors. Naturally, many other factors, such as the skill level and training of the combatants, determine the outcome of a fight, but the widely held belief in this relationship among the styles is embodied in the cliché amongst boxing fans and writers that styles make fights. Brawlers tend to overcome swarmers or in-fighters because, in trying to get close to the slugger, the in-fighter will invariably have to walk straight into the guns of the much harder-hitting brawler, so, unless the former has a very good chin and the latter's stamina is poor, the brawler's superior power will carry the day. A famous example of this type of match-up advantage would be George Foreman's knockout victory over Joe Frazier in their original bout The Sunshine Showdown. Although in-fighters struggle against heavy sluggers, they typically enjoy more success against outfighters or boxers. Outfighters prefer a slower fight, with some distance between themselves and the opponent. The infighter tries to close that gap and unleash furious flurries. On the inside, the outfighter loses a lot of his combat effectiveness, because he cannot throw the hard punches. The infighter is generally successful in this case, due to his intensity in advancing on his opponent and his good agility which makes him difficult to evade. For example, the swarming Joe Frazier, though easily dominated by the slugger George Foreman, was able to create many more problems for the boxer Muhammad Ali in their three fights. Joe Louis, after retirement, admitted that he hated being crowded, and that swarmers like untied undefeated champ Rocky Marciano would have caused him style problems even in his prime. The boxer or outfighter tends to be most successful against a brawler, whose slow speed, both hand and foot, and poor technique makes him an easy target to hit for the faster outfighter. The outfighter's main concern is to stay alert, as the brawler only needs to land one good punch to finish the fight. If the outfighter can avoid those power punches, he can often wear the brawler down with fast jabs, tiring him out. If he is successful enough, he may even apply extra pressure in the later rounds in an attempt to achieve a knockout. Most classic boxers, such as Muhammad Ali, enjoyed their best successes against sluggers. An example of a style matchup was the historical fight of Julio Cesar Chavez, a swarmer or in fighter, against Mudrick Taylor, the boxer or out fighter. See Julio Cesar Chavez vs. Mudrick Taylor. The match was nicknamed Thunder Meets Lightning as an allusion to punching power of Chavez and blinding speed of Taylor. Chavez was the epitome of the Mexican style of boxing. Taylor's hand and foot speed and boxing abilities gave him the early advantage, allowing him to begin building a large lead on points. Chavez remained relentless in his pursuit of Taylor and due to his greater punching power Chavez slowly punished Taylor. Coming into the later rounds, Taylor was bleeding from the mouth, his entire face was swollen, the bones around his eye socket had been broken, 
he had swallowed a considerable amount of his own blood, and as he grew tired, Taylor was increasingly forced into exchanging blows with Chavez, which only gave Chavez a greater chance to cause damage. While there was little doubt that Taylor had solidly won the first three quarters of the fight, the question at hand was whether he would survive the final quarter. Going into the final round, Taylor held a secure lead on the scorecards of two of the three judges. Chavez would have to knock Taylor out to claim a victory, whereas Taylor merely needed to stay away from the Mexican legend. However, Taylor did not stay away, but continued to trade blows with Chavez. As he did so, Taylor showed signs of extreme exhaustion, and every tick of the clock brought Taylor closer to victory unless Chavez could knock him out. With about a minute left in the round, Chavez hit Taylor squarely with several hard punches and stayed on the attack, continuing to hit Taylor with well-placed shots. Finally, with about 25 seconds to go, Chavez landed a hard right hand that caused Taylor to stagger forward towards a corner, forcing Chavez back ahead of him. Suddenly Chavez stepped around Taylor, positioning him so that Taylor was trapped in the corner, with no way to escape from Chavez's desperate final flurry. Chavez then nailed Taylor with a tremendous right hand that dropped the younger man. By using the ring ropes to pull himself up, Taylor managed to return to his feet and was given the mandatory eight count. Referee Richard Steele asked Taylor twice if he was able to continue fighting, but Taylor failed to answer. Steele then concluded that Taylor was unfit to continue and signaled that he was ending the fight, resulting in a TKO victory for Chavez with only two seconds to go in the bout. Equipment Since boxing involves forceful, repetitive punching, precautions must be taken to prevent damage to bones in the hand. Most trainers do not allow boxers to train and spar without wrist wraps and boxing gloves. Hand wraps are used to secure the bones in the hand, and the gloves are used to protect the hands from blunt injury, allowing boxers to throw punches with more force than if they did not utilize them. Gloves have been required in competition since the late 19th century, though modern boxing gloves are much heavier than those worn by early 20th century fighters. Prior to a bout, both boxers agree upon the weight of gloves to be used in the bout, with the understanding that lighter gloves allow heavy punches to inflict more damage. The brand of gloves can also affect the impact of punches, so this too is usually stipulated before a bout. A mouth guard is important to protect the teeth and gums from injury, and to cushion the jaw, resulting in a decreased chance of knockout. Both fighters must wear soft-soled shoes to reduce the damage from accidental, or intentional, stepping on feet. While older boxing boots more commonly resembled those of a professional wrestler, modern boxing shoes and boots tend to be quite similar to their amateur wrestling counterparts. Boxers practice their skills on two basic types of punching bags. A small, teardrop-shaped speed bag is used to hone reflexes and repetitive punching skills, while a large cylindrical heavy bag filled with sand, a synthetic substitute or water is used to practice power punching and body blows. In addition to these distinctive pieces of equipment, boxers also utilize sport non-specific training equipment to build strength, speed, agility, and stamina. Common training equipment includes free weights, rowing machines, jump rope, and medicine balls. Boxing matches typically take place in a boxing ring, a raised platform surrounded by ropes attached to posts rising in each corner. The term ring has come to be used as a metaphor for many aspects of prize fighting in general. Technique Stance The modern boxing stance differs substantially from the typical boxing stances of the 19th and early 20th centuries. The modern stance has a more upright vertical armed guard, as opposed to the more horizontal, knuckles facing forward guard adopted by early 20th century hook users such as Jack Johnson. In a fully upright stance, the boxer stands with the legs shoulder width apart and the rear foot a half step in front of the lead man. Right handed or orthodox boxers lead with the left foot and fist, for most penetration power. Both feet are parallel, and the right heel is off the ground. The lead, left fist is held vertically about six inches in front of the face at eye level. The rear, right, 
fist is held beside the chin and the elbow tucked against the ribcage to protect the body. The chin is tucked into the chest to avoid punches to the jaw which commonly cause knockouts and is often kept lightly off enter. Wrists are slightly bent to avoid damage when punching and the elbows are kept tucked in to protect the ribcage. Some boxers fight from a crouch, leaning forward and keeping their feet closer together. The stance described is considered the textbook stance and fighters are encouraged to change it around once it's been mastered as a base. Case in point, many fast fighters have their hands down and have almost exaggerated footwork, while brawlers or bully fighters tend to slowly stalk their opponents. Left-handed or southpaw fighters use a mirror image of the orthodox stance, which can create problems for orthodox fighters unaccustomed to receiving jabs, hooks, or crosses from the opposite side. The southpaw stance, conversely, is vulnerable to a straight right hand. North American fighters tend to favor a more balanced stance, facing the opponent almost squarely, while many European fighters stand with their torso turned more to the side. The positioning of the hands may also vary, as some fighters prefer to have both hands raised in front of the face, risking exposure to body shots. Modern boxers can sometimes be seen tapping their cheeks or foreheads with their fists in order to remind themselves to keep their hands up, which becomes difficult during long bouts. Boxers are taught to push off with their feet in order to move effectively. Forward motion involves lifting the lead leg and pushing with the rear leg. Rearward motion involves lifting the rear leg and pushing with the lead leg. During lateral motion the leg in the direction of the movement moves first while the opposite leg provides the force needed to move the body. Punches There are four basic punches in boxing, the jab, cross, hook and uppercut. Any punch other than a jab is considered a power punch. If a boxer is right-handed, orthodox, his left hand is the lead hand and his right hand is the rear hand. For a left-handed boxer or southpaw, the hand positions are reversed. For clarity, the following discussion will assume a right-handed boxer. Jab, a quick, straight punch thrown with the lead hand from the guard position. The jab is accompanied by a small, clockwise rotation of the torso and hips, while the fist rotates 90 degrees, becoming horizontal upon impact. As the punch reaches full extension, the lead shoulder can be brought up to guard the chin. The rear hand remains next to the face to guard the jaw. After making contact with the target, the lead hand is retracted quickly to resume a guard position in front of the face. The jab is recognized as the most important punch in a boxer's arsenal because it provides a fair amount of its own cover and it leaves the least amount of space for a counter punch from the opponent. It is the longest reach of any punch and does not require commitment or large weight transfers. Due to its relatively weak power, the jab is often used as a tool to gauge distances, probe an opponent's defenses, harass an opponent, and set up heavier, more powerful punches. A half step may be added, moving the entire body into the punch, for additional power. Some notable boxers who have been able to develop relative power in their jabs and use it to punish or wear down their opponents to some effect include Larry Holmes and Vladimir Klitschko. The jab is recognized as the most important punch in a boxer's arsenal because it provides a fair amount of its own cover and it leaves the least amount of space for a counter punch from the opponent. It is the longest reach of any punch and does not require commitment or large weight transfers. Due to its relatively weak power, the jab is often used as a tool to gauge distances, probe an opponent's defenses, harass an opponent, and set up heavier, more powerful punches. A half step may be added, moving the entire body into the punch, for additional power. Some notable boxers who have been able to develop relative power in their jabs and use it to punish or wear down their opponents to some effect include Larry Holmes and Vladimir Klitschko, cross, a powerful, straight punch thrown with the rear hand. From the guard position, the rear hand is thrown from the chin, crossing the body and traveling towards the target in a straight line. The rear shoulder is thrust forward and finishes just touching the outside of the chin. At the same time, the lead hand is retracted and tucked against the face to protect the inside of the chin. For additional power, the torso and hips are rotated counterclockwise as the cross is thrown. 
A measure of an ideally extended cross is that the shoulder of the striking arm, the knee of the front leg and the ball of the front foot are on the same vertical plane. Weight is also transferred from the rear foot to the lead foot, resulting in the rear heel turning outwards as it acts as a fulcrum for the transfer of weight. Body rotation and the sudden weight transfer is what gives the cross its power. Like the jab, a half step forward may be added. After the cross is thrown, the hand is retracted quickly and the guard position resumed. It can be used to counter punch a jab, aiming for the opponent's head, or a counter to a cross aimed at the body, or to set up a hook. The cross is also called a straight, or right, especially if it does not cross the opponent's outstretched jab. Weight is also transferred from the rear foot to the lead foot, resulting in the rear heel turning outwards as it acts as a fulcrum for the transfer of weight. Body rotation and the sudden weight transfer is what gives the cross its power. Like the jab, a half step forward may be added. After the cross is thrown, the hand is retracted quickly and the guard position resumed. It can be used to counter punch a jab, aiming for the opponent's head, or a counter to a cross aimed at the body, or to set up a hook. The cross is also called a straight, or right, especially if it does not cross the opponent's outstretched jab, hook. A semicircular punch thrown with the lead hand to the side of the opponent's head. From the guard position, the elbow is drawn back with the horizontal fist, knuckles pointing forward, and the elbow bent. The rear hand is tucked firmly against the jaw to protect the chin. The torso and hips are rotated clockwise, propelling the fist through a tight, clockwise arc across the front of the body and connecting with the target. At the same time, the lead foot pivots clockwise turning the left heel outwards. Upon contact, the hook's circular path ends abruptly and the lead hand is pulled quickly back into the guard position. A hook may also target the lower body and this technique is sometimes called the rip to distinguish it from the conventional hook to the head. The hook may also be thrown with the rear hand. Notable left hookers include Joe Frazier and Mike Tyson. At the same time, the lead foot pivots clockwise, turning the left heel outwards. Upon contact, the hook's circular path ends abruptly and the lead hand is pulled quickly back into the guard position. A hook may also target the lower body and this technique is sometimes called the rip to distinguish it from the conventional hook to the head. The hook may also be thrown with the rear hand. Notable left hookers include Joe Frazier and Mike Tyson, uppercut, a vertical, rising punch thrown with the rear hand. From the guard position, the torso shifts slightly to the right, the rear hand drops below the level of the opponent's chest and the knees are bent slightly. From this position, the rear hand is thrust upwards in a rising arc towards the opponent's chin or torso. At the same time, the knees push upwards quickly and the torso and hips rotate anti-clockwise and the rear heel turns outward, mimicking the body movement of the cross. The strategic utility of the uppercut depends on its ability to lift the opponent's body, setting it off balance for successive attacks. The right uppercut followed by a left hook is a deadly combination employing the uppercut to lift the opponent's chin into a vulnerable position, then the hook to knock the opponent out. At the same time, the knees push upwards quickly and the torso and hips rotate anti-clockwise and the rear heel turns outward, mimicking the body movement of the cross. The strategic utility of the uppercut depends on its ability to lift the opponent's body, setting it off balance for successive attacks. The right uppercut followed by a left hook is a deadly combination employing the uppercut to lift the opponent's chin into a vulnerable position, then the hook to knock the opponent out. These different punch types can be thrown in rapid succession to form combinations or combos. The most common is the jab and cross combination, nicknamed the one-two combo. This is usually an effective combination, because the jab blocks the opponent's view of the cross, making it easier to land cleanly and forcefully. A large, swinging circular punch starting from a cocked back position with the arm at a longer extension than the hook and all of the fighter's weight behind it is sometimes referred to as a roundhouse, haymaker, or sucker punch. Relying on body weight and centripetal force within a wide arc, the roundhouse can be a powerful blow but it is often a wild and uncontrolled punch that leaves the fighter delivering it off balance and with an open guard. Wide, looping punches have the further disadvantage of taking more time to deliver, 
giving the opponent ample warning to react and counter. For this reason, the haymaker or roundhouse is not a conventional punch, and is regarded by trainers as a mark of poor technique or desperation. Sometimes it has been used, because of its immense potential power, to finish off an already staggering opponent who seems unable or unlikely to take advantage of the poor position it leaves the puncher in. Another unconventional punch is the rarely used bolo punch, in which the opponent swings an arm out several times in a wide arc, usually as a distraction, before delivering with either that or the other arm. An illegal punch to the back of the head or neck is known as a rabbit punch. Defense There are several basic maneuvers a boxer can use in order to evade or block punches, depicted and discussed below. Slip Slipping rotates the body slightly so that an incoming punch passes harmlessly next to the head. As the opponent's punch arrives, the boxer sharply rotates the hips and shoulders. This turns the chin sideways and allows the punch to slip past. Muhammad Ali was famous for extremely fast and close slips, as was an early Mike Tyson, sway or fade, to anticipate a punch and move the upper body or head back so that it misses or has its force appreciably lessened. Also called rolling with the punch, or riding the punch, duck or break, to drop down with the back straight so that a punch aimed at the head glances or misses entirely, bob and weave, bobbing moves the head laterally and beneath an incoming punch. As the opponent's punch arrives, the boxer bends the legs quickly and simultaneously shifts the body either slightly right or left. Once the punch has been evaded, the boxer weaves back to an upright position emerging on either the outside or inside of the opponent's still extended arm. To move outside the opponent's extended arm is called bobbing to the outside. To move inside the opponent's extended arm is called bobbing to the inside. Joe Frazier, Jack Dempsey, Mike Tyson and Rocky Marciano were masters of bobbing and weaving. Parry block, parrying or blocking uses the boxer's shoulder, hands or arms as defensive tools to protect against incoming attacks. A block generally receives a punch while a parry tends to deflect it. A palm, catch, or cuff is a defense which intentionally takes the incoming punch on the palm portion of the defender's glove. Floyd Mayweather Jr. is a master of this technique. The cover-up, covering up is the last opportunity, other than rolling with a punch, to avoid an incoming strike to an unprotected face or body. Generally speaking, the hands are held high to protect the head and chin and the forearms are tucked against the torso to impede body shots. When protecting the body, the boxer rotates the hips and lets incoming punches roll off the guard. To protect the head, the boxer presses both fists against the front of the face with the forearms parallel and facing outwards. This type of guard is weak against attacks from below, the clinch. Clinching is a form of trapping or a rough form of grappling and occurs when the distance between both fighters has closed and straight punches cannot be employed. In this situation, the boxer attempts to hold or tie up the opponent's hands so he is unable to throw hooks or uppercuts. To perform a clinch, the boxer loops both hands around the outside of the opponent's shoulders, scooping back under the forearms to grasp the opponent's arms tightly against his own body. In this position, the opponent's arms are pinned and cannot be used to attack. Clinching is a temporary match state and is quickly dissipated by the referee. Clinching is technically against the rules, and in amateur fights points are deducted fairly quickly for it. It is unlikely, however, to see points deducted for a clinch in professional boxing. Philly shell or shoulder roll defense This is actually a variation of the cross-arm defense. The lead arm, left for an orthodox fighter and right for a southpaw, is placed across the torso usually somewhere in between the belly button and chest and the lead hand rests on the opposite side of the fighter's torso. The back hand is placed on the side of the face, right side for orthodox fighters and left side for southpaws. The lead shoulder is brought in tight against the side of the face, left side for orthodox fighters and right side for southpaws. This style is used by fighters who like to counterpunch. To execute this guard a fighter must be very athletic and experienced. This style is so effective for counterpunching because it allows fighters to slip punches by rotating and dipping their upper body and causing blows to glance off the fighter. After the punch glances off, 
the fighter's backhand is in perfect position to hit their out-of-position opponent. The shoulder lean is used in this stance. To execute the shoulder lean a fighter rotates and ducks, to the right for orthodox fighters and to the left for southpaws, when their opponent's punch is coming towards them and then rotates back towards their opponent while their opponent is bringing their hand back. The fighter will throw a punch with their back hand as they are rotating towards their undefended opponent. The weakness to this style is that when a fighter is stationary and not rotating they are opening to be hit so a fighter must be athletic and well conditioned to effectively execute this style. To beat this style, fighters like to jab their opponent's shoulder causing the shoulder and arm to be in pain and to demobilize that arm. Fighters that use this defense include Sugar Ray Robinson, Ken Norton, also used this defense, Pinel Whitaker, James Tony, and Floyd Mayweather Jr. Floyd Mayweather Jr. is considered to be the master of this technique. Less common strategies The rope-a-dope strategy, used by Muhammad Ali in his 1974 The Rumble in the Jungle bout against George Foreman, the rope-a-dope method involves lying back against the ropes, covering up defensively as much as possible and allowing the opponent to attempt numerous punches. The back leaning posture, which does not cause the defending boxer to become as unbalanced as they would during normal backward movement, also maximizes the distance of the defender's head from his opponent, increasing the probability that punches will miss their intended target. Weathering the blows that do land, the defender lures the opponent into expending energy while conserving his her own. If successful, the attacking opponent will eventually tire, creating defensive flaws which the boxer can exploit. In modern boxing, the rope a dope is generally discouraged since most opponents are not fooled by it and few boxers possess the physical toughness to withstand a prolonged, unanswered assault. Recently, however, eight division world champion Manny Pacquiao skillfully used the strategy to gauge the power of welterweight titlist Miguel Cotto in November 2009. Pacquiao followed up the rope-a-dope gambit with a withering knockdown, bolo punch, occasionally seen in Olympic boxing, the bolo is an arm punch which owes its power to the shortening of a circular arc rather than to transference of body weight. It tends to have more of an effect due to the surprise of the odd angle it lands at rather than the actual power of the punch. This is more of a gimmick than a technical maneuver. This punch is not taught being on the same plane in boxing technicality as is the Ali shuffle. Nevertheless, a few professional boxers have used the bolo punch to great effect, including former welterweight champions Sugar Ray Leonard, and Kid Gavilan. Middleweight champion Cifrino Garcia is regarded as the inventor of the bolo punch, overhand right, the overhand right is a punch not found in every boxer's arsenal. Unlike the right cross, which has a trajectory parallel to the ground, the overhand right has a looping circular arc as it is thrown over the shoulder with the palm facing away from the boxer. It is especially popular with smaller stature boxers trying to reach taller opponents. Boxers who have used this punch consistently and effectively include former heavyweight champions Rocky Marciano and Tim Witherspoon, as well as MMA champions Chuck Liddell and Fedor Emelianenko. The overhand right has become a popular weapon in other tournaments that involve fist striking. Check hook. A check hook is employed to prevent aggressive boxers from lunging in. There are two parts to the check hook. The first part consists of a regular hook. The second, trickier part involves the footwork. As the opponent lunges in, the boxer should throw the hook and pivot on his left foot and swing his right foot 180 degrees around. If executed correctly, the aggressive boxer will lunge in and sail harmlessly past his opponent like a bull missing a matador. This is rarely seen in professional boxing as it requires a great disparity in skill level to execute. Technically speaking it has been said that there is no such thing as a check hook and that it is simply a hook applied to an opponent that has lurched forward and past his opponent who simply hooks him on the way past. Others have argued that the check hook exists but is an illegal punch due to it being a pivot punch which is illegal in the sport. Floyd Mayweather, J.R. employed the use of a check hook against Ricky Hatton, which sent Hatton flying head first into the corner post and being knocked down. Hatton managed to get himself to his feet after the knockdown but was clearly dazed and it was only a matter of moments before Mayweather landed a flurry of punches which sent Hatton crashing to the canvas, 
giving Mayweather a TKO victory in the 10th round and handing Hatton his first defeat. Ring Corner In boxing, each fighter is given a corner of the ring where he rests in between rounds and where his trainers stand. Typically, three men stand in the corner besides the boxer himself. These are the trainer, the assistant trainer and the cutman. The trainer and assistant typically give advice to the boxer on what he is doing wrong as well as encouraging him if he is losing. The cutman is a cutaneous doctor responsible for keeping the boxer's face and eyes free of cuts and blood. This is of particular importance because many fights are stopped because of cuts that threaten the boxer's eyes. In addition, the corner is responsible for stopping the fight if they feel their fighter is in grave danger of permanent injury. The corner will occasionally throw in a white towel to signify a boxer's surrender, the idiomatic phrase to throw in the towel, meaning to give up, derives from this practice. This can be seen in the fight between Diego Corrales and Floyd Mayweather. In that fight, Corrales' corner surrendered despite Corrales' steadfast refusal. Medical Concerns Knocking a person unconscious or even causing concussion may cause permanent brain damage. There is no clear division between the force required to knock a person out and the force likely to kill a person. Since 1980, more than 200 amateur boxers, professional boxers and tournament fighters have died due to ring or training injuries. In 1983, the Journal of the American Medical Association called for a ban on boxing. The editor, Dr. George Lundberg, called boxing an obscenity that should not be sanctioned by any civilized society. Since then, the British, Canadian and Australian medical associations also have called for bans on boxing. Supporters of the ban state that boxing is the only sport where hurting the other athlete is the goal. Dr Bill O'Neill, boxing spokesman for the British Medical Association, has supported the BMA's proposed ban on boxing, it is the only sport where the intention is to inflict serious injury on your opponent, and we feel that we must have a total ban on boxing. Opponents respond that such a position is misguided opinion, stating that amateur boxing is scored solely according to total connecting blows with no award for injury. They observe that many skilled professional boxers have had rewarding careers without inflicting injury on opponents by accumulating scoring blows and avoiding punches winning round score 10-9 by the 10-point must system, and they note that there are many other sports where concussions are much more prevalent. In 2007, one study of amateur boxers showed that protective headgear did not prevent brain damage, and another found that amateur boxers faced a high risk of brain damage. The Gothenburg study analyzed temporary levels of neurofilament light in cerebral spinal fluid which they conclude is evidence of damage, even though the levels soon subside. More comprehensive studies of neurological function on larger samples performed by Johns Hopkins University and accident rates analyzed by National Safety Council show amateur boxing is a comparatively safe sport. In 1997, the American Association of Professional Ringside Physicians was established to create medical protocols through research and education to prevent injuries in boxing. Professional boxing is forbidden in Norway, Iceland, Iran and North Korea. It was banned in Sweden until 2007 when the ban was lifted but strict restrictions, including four three-minute rounds for fights, were imposed. It was banned in Albania from 1965 till the fall of communism in 1991. It is now legal. Boxing Hall of Fame The sport of boxing has two internationally recognized boxing halls of fame. The International Boxing Hall of Fame, IBHOF, and the World Boxing Hall of Fame, WBHF, with the IBHOF being the more widely recognized boxing hall of fame. The WBHF was founded by Everett L. Sanders in 1980. Since its inception the WBHOF has never had a permanent location or museum, which has allowed the more recent IBHOF to garner more publicity and prestige. Among the notable names in the WBHF are Ricardo Finito Lopez, Gabriel Flasher Lord, Michael Cabajal, Kaosai Galaxy, Henry Armstrong, Jack Johnson, Roberto Duran, George Foreman, Cifrino Garcia and Salvador Sanchez. 
Boxing's International Hall of Fame was inspired by a tribute an American town held for two local heroes in 1982. The town, Canastota, New York, which is about 15 miles, 24 kilometers, east of Syracuse, via the New York State Thruway, honored former world welterweight middleweight champion Carmen Basilio and his nephew, former world welterweight champion Billy Bacchus. The people of Canastota raised money for the tribute which inspired the idea of creating an official, annual Hall of Fame for notable boxers. The International Boxing Hall of Fame opened in Canastota in 1989. The first inductees in 1990 included Jack Johnson, Benny Leonard, Jack Dempsey, Henry Armstrong, Sugar Ray Robinson, Archie Moore, and Muhammad Ali. Other world-class figures include Salvador Sanchez, Fabio Matea, Roberto Manos de Pedra Duran, Ricardo Lopez, Gabriel Flasher Lord, Vicent Soldivar, Ismael Laguna, Eusebio Pedroza, Carlos Monzon, Azamar Nelson, Rocky Marciano, Pepino Cuevas and Ken Buchanan. The Hall of Fame's induction ceremony is held every June as part of a four-day event. The fans who come to Canastota for the induction weekend are treated to a number of events including scheduled autograph sessions, boxing exhibitions, a parade featuring past and present inductees, and the induction ceremony itself. Governing and Sanctioning Bodies British Boxing Board of Control, BBBOFC, European Boxing Union, Nevada State Athletic Commission, International Boxing Federation, IBF, World Boxing Association, WBA, World Boxing Council, WBC, World Boxing Organization, WBO, International Boxing Association, AIBA. Now also professional. Boxer Rankings There are various organizations and websites that rank boxers in both weight class and pound for pound manner. Box Rec, Ratings, The Ring, Ratings, ESPN, Ratings, Transnational Boxing Rankings Board, Ratings.